This first one, <clears throat> this first one, the same thing happened, even though we tried on cutting it down and stuff, this one ended up the same as last time we did this. The first one was over 3,000. It's like 3,000 plus, I think it's 2,700 words. And, um, but the future ones, I'm trying to shrink everything down. And um, the, the deal was last time we did this, uh, we Bunt, it was a project they did with Bunty as I was studying and he was overseeing it and um, uh, this started as an effort to examine all the parts and some of, one of the things that chases people away from Buddhism is all the parts. <laughs> it's very simple. Some people don't want to uh, you know go beyond three parts or something with a lot of the Christian system, and I don't know much about the other systems. I know some, but it depends, of course, how far you want to investigate things. But what um, we, we're looking at is um, not telling you the story of Buddhism. This isn't for a person that comes in first time to Buddhism and they want to hear the Sunday school version of what exactly, wait, I have to pull this out. It's just going to keep doing this there. Now it'll be happy. Um, it's in the Sunday school when you're teaching people about Buddhism, you're always going to start with the story of the Buddha. And we're not starting like that. We are starting uh, with when this is TWIM, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, and showing you where this, try to show you where this all comes from. And we're talking to you about um, how this, got, and I wish I had it printed out in front of me, it would help, but I don't have a printer here. And so it's, it's very, it's kind of difficult. So I might be going in and out a little bit to the document as I'm doing this. I want to know if you can still hear me when I am uh, talking to you, when I minimize the screen and I'm looking at the document for just a minute and I want you kind of to take notes on the pieces that I'm going to talk about, okay? I, I don't know if I did that right. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, that's good. Yes. Hang, hang in there for a minute. So the first, the first part is just uh, really talking to you about the breaking down of Buddhism as far as uh, philosophy, or and I'm just you can take notes on this. Just philosophy. Is it is it a philosophy? Is it a religion? Or are we going to talk about how it might be a science? That's the first part. And uh, then we look at what the, the first guideline piece anyone ever hears about basically is uh, after the Four Noble Truths is precepts and the precepts and what they're actually for. And I'm going to uh, show you a little bit in the text about that part. And then along with the precepts, there is a cousin, a, another piece to this, and that's the hindrances. And I'll tell you why as we go through. So you understand why are the precepts and hindrances? Why should they be taught together side by side? And the next piece is why practice meditation? What are we trying to do? Um, and this is guided by the Four Noble Truths. And um, uh, the idea that this the use of dependent origination, the way that we can use it, and um, the three characteristics. So there's actually, these pieces are interesting, and I'll tell you why, because there's a secret about learning the three characteristics, and many, many times we hear the, the three characteristics are so important, that's it, all we have to know are the three characteristics. Um, but there's a secret way that the, it's not really secret, but the Buddha taught it a specific way where if you learned one thing, you would automatically learn that, that three characteristics deeper than you would imagine. Then the next thing we look at, we look at the, when you're starting out with your practice, there are two sets of three that we look at and, um, uh, we talk to you a lot about uh, the, the two sets are Dhanasila Bhavana and the second one is 
the Sila Samadhi Panya, okay? And I don't know how, um, but I know that uh, over time, uh, the Dhanasila Bhavana, it doesn't get talked about very much outside of if you're in a Sunday school connected with a temple. But if you're in a, like a meditation center and you're learning meditation, you're not likely to hear much about this part, but it really did play an important part. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, okay, the next part is, um, oh yeah, there's a little thing I've, I've already told you about the validation film. I hope you guys went and watched the validation film. Um, then the next part is where, where is this, where is the, the, the training supposed to lead, the training? Where is it supposed to lead? And, um, and the Buddha actually, you know, he talks to us about that. If you've been to our retreats, the last night of the retreat, you basically hear what it is that the uh, Buddha expects his monks in their behavior to change if they were practicing the meditation properly and they were progressing he explains how the, the most significant way that it's going to change if um, they did it right, and it has to do with their speech, and the speech leads to behavior. So uh, this is a mind speech, um, mind speech behavior or bodily action. Mind speech bodily action is a short way of saying behavior isn't it? And so that gets interesting. And then um, we go a little bit into the, um, the Tanha and talk a little bit about what he's doing with the defining, uh, what Bhante's doing with defining Tanha and the nature of the Tanha, the, the, the composition of the Tanha happening with it. We're, we're talking a little bit about the tanha um, with uh, how you can identify it, the symptom. We're looking for the symptom. So if we're looking for saying that, if we start by saying, you know, that the suffering is, an, is, a, is a disease, we want to know the symptom. And if you have the symptom, you have the this illness, and then if you identify this symptom and you can see it happening as it's occurring, you can let go of it. So this is, this is about your practice. You're getting up to Sama Wayama. Um, the Sama Wayama is the answer was there all the time. And I don't mention it in this paper because some of these pieces are going to have um, some of these pieces talking about in this opening piece they have individual installments. That's why we were trying to remove some of it out that was there before and just talk about some of the pieces within their own installment is what I'm trying to do. Um, then there were some things that, thing that uh, uh, a very valuable player for us because Bonte was with him for two and a half years um, and I, you know, was drowned sort of in the beginning mm -hmm. by his books. And he had a gift in his writing that was very special because out of the 80 some odd, I think it was 88 books altogether by the time he died, uh, but a majority of those books, there's a large part of them that are written so well, you would not know that they were Buddhist. And this is important because it makes you understand he was very in touch with the, um, the idea that the Buddha was teaching something that was humanistic, something that was for all of humanity. And as I've said to you many times, uh, you know, he, he, the Buddha was not teaching Buddhists. We can usually understand that. They didn't have Buddhists until after the Buddha was gone, but they had a following of Buddha Gautama. So in that sense, maybe they talked about Buddhists, but they didn't really have the official Buddhists. They weren't there until 
uh, after he was gone, that's when that happened, and Buddhism happened, you see. And then we look at briefly, it's again, what was the, um, what was the, the real gift um, that the Buddha gave us? Mm. There is there, can we point to one thing that he gave us? And um, is that still something that is functional today? And, and it gets very exciting when you look at that and you start uh, to- Kay, Who are you talking about? The author that wrote 80 books? Who is this? Keshri Dhammananda, the late, the late uh, most venerable- oh, The late chief, Dhamananda. the late chief, okay. Yeah. Keshri yeah. Dhammananda Mahatera, okay? That's who I'm talking about with the books. That's okay. Yeah, that's good. We should get that in there. <laughs> okay. okay. And, and then it was the real gift from the Buddha. Okay. And then we go, and then we keep going. And um, uh, let's see. And then at the end, I gave you a little simile because before I was a nun, I was very much into farming and, and into gardening and uh, growing vegetables. And so I gave you the vegetable garden. Um, it's something that I wrote back in uh, 2004, 2005, because I started reading the, <laughs> I started reading the, the book a lot, you know, the Majima Nikaya, and Bhante had a lot of assignments for me, okay, and um, let me get rid of this now, I'm going to um, just pop up the, here I come back to you, whoops. Whoops, I am going to come back to you. There. There. Here, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I had to do that because I got everything done today with two long sittings with editing and everything and working with May down in uh, Sydney. And thank you, May. <laughs> it was really a good lesson for me. But all of this is learning how to work with new computer programs is difficult for me. I'm, uh, you know, I have a disability and it's, it's slow and I have to keep doing stuff all the time. Really, really keep doing it in order to retain it because of an injury I had one time. So I, I have, it's hard, it's slow, but May is a very good teacher. She's very patient. <laughs> and I think we did really well today. So, okay, when we talk about Buddhism first and look at what it actually was, um, Right up front, I want to say, you all know if you've looked around and been looking at Buddhism and searching it and investigating it, wow, there's a lot of Buddhism. <laughs> and when we go to the, you know, you know, out here in Asia, we can go into a country and there's one big Buddhism and then another country, there's another big Buddhism and another province and there's another sort of different Buddhism. But when you go to America, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because when you get to America, there is like when uh, 37, probably by now in the 50s, different types of Buddhism functioning in America, that people want to say that's Buddhism. And Buddhism has no Pope, no head to say, this is what we are, don't go outside of these boundaries. And so it, you, you and I, uh, you know, our deacon and I can invent a Buddhism next week and start to call it the, um, let's see, the Ardhakanti Buddhism. Ard, 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 what is it, Ardhika? The Ard, <laughs> we can tie our names together and call it a Buddhism. And what's happened in modern times, a few things have happened that are interesting. Because um, I've had historians say, you know, in, way back, there were not retreats. There were Buddhist, uh, there were Buddhist uh, schools, and the Buddha had a moving school that was moving around, and you could study with him like almost a gypsy moving around the, India in this story. And people would come and study with him and go away and practice, right? But... Um, Today we have such a vast number of them. So what are we looking for? If you, you and I are, decide we are going to look for what 
the Buddha taught? What did he find? I have these irritating questions. What did he find? What did this person find? And if he did find something, um, did it work? And if it did work, are the instructions still there? And if the instructions are, can I repeat what he did? Can that happen? Well, the answer is yes to all of that. <laughs> okay, yes to all of that. Um, but, you know, in America, it's all mixed up like a soup and they have trouble even with the idea of Sangha uh, because we need Sangha in the Theravada, but it doesn't seem to happen. And maybe we're, we're just 50 or 70 years into this. It might still come along. And then, uh, you know, that it, it's very, it's very, not tight like Catholicism uh, or the uh, Muslim or the Jew or uh, the Christian. It's, it's, it's not tightened like that. But so I want to know what he said. That was my issue. And Bhante went about it the same way. That's why we got along so well, okay? And when we go and look at this, first you have to spend a little time, what was this Buddha Dhamma. Now, see, I said something different just then. I didn't say Buddhism. I said Buddha Dhamma. So Dhamma means teaching. And when I say Buddha Dhamma, it's the teaching of Buddha Gautama. And that's what I was looking for. And the, the, the uh, agreement pretty much is that among the scholars that nowadays that the Pali Canon has the closest thing to the words of this Buddha. So um, another question that comes up with people who write about this is uh, one that came up uh, for us and it had already come up for K. Sri Dhammananda too. And th this is what we say about it is, what is it? Is, is, was this philosophy that he taught or religion or science? So, okay, in, in terms of philosophy, you can say basically philosophy is a lot of books, a lot of reading and a lot of talking and debating, but it doesn't always transfer very much into behavior modification in, in life. It doesn't come into life. Philosophy is outside of basically, uh, you can be a bohemian and be a philosopher, okay? And, and so it doesn't have a moral code and it doesn't have this and that and the other the way you find normally. So philosophy is quite different and that's not Buddhism that way. So uh, religious, religion as a religion, uh, it gets interesting. The Latin word religio uh, refers to a monotheistic uh, creator that is involved in making the person whole and saving them. A salvation is involved, okay? So that's how we look at religion. Now, as far as Buddhism is concerned, it doesn't fit because we don't have this, um, the higher creator involved in taking responsibility for our uh, mind, our speech, and our actions, or our destiny. We don't have that. In our case, in Buddhism, you are personally responsible. Some people today, they don't like that idea. They rather would like to have somebody they feel is going to carry them if it's too hard. But the Buddha does another, another way of handling. He's going to give you the tools to handle absolutely everything. But you are personally responsible, and there is no way outside of that, okay? So religio doesn't work. Now, I don't remember. I was looking for it today, but there is a Greek word that has to do with religion that was with the ancient Greeks. I got it from a Greek philosopher, and I haven't located it yet. I had it in my notes, but let me explain it to you. There was another word other than religio in the Latin. There was a word the Greeks held close to, and their idea, they had the... Um, existential pantheistic, you know, gods and Olympus and all of that. But the thing was, religion was important to them for a particular reason. 
it made the person feel complete, feel whole. And this is interesting to me because today in mental health, if you are hospitalized or you have a serious breakdown, they're not going to let you go in the allopathic medical community. They are not going to let you go back and try to live again in mainstream unless they can say to you, uh, you understand now what happened in your brain and you are healthy in your body. That's the second part. And you, are per you have to show us, show the doctors that there is a spiritual pursuit that you have that will make you balanced as a human being. So this spiritual pursuit, interestingly enough, is included in the past to get from the hospital out into mainstream life to try to live again amongst the regular population. So this can be anything. I was uh, clowning around with it and saying it, it, it can be um, tree worship. It can be, uh, you know, the tree spirits that live in the tree, talking to the trees. If you want it to be that, that's fine. They'll accept it. You can be a white witch if you wish. They don't want you to be a dark witch, but <laughs> it's too depressing and, and too, but Uh-oh. Sister. I'm calling her. Yeah. Ah, uh, so. In that respect, in the Greek idea, we can say, well, that's similar to Buddhism because Buddhism balances the person and it's balancing your mental, verbal, physical actions so that you are a balanced human being. That's what it's after. The third, the third division though is interesting. The third division in modern time, we can't leave it out. I'm not gonna go into it a lot, but I'm gonna say that because of research in cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science that came after that, we have an ongoing search for where does consciousness live in the human body? And as we're doing that, I'll tell you a secret. All the funding money for that, that's underneath that huge movement, believe it or not, you can research it yourself, is basically happening. So in the future, we can have better androids and robots. It has to do with the development of AI, artificial intelligence, and all the information from all of the research that has to do with cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science is funneled into a, um, an intelligence system for the development of the best AI possible. That's what I found out. This is very interesting. So science-wise, um, we're right there, right there in modern times. And if I, as we go along and we discuss some things, I will be giving you uh, some links to some useful uh, the things that you can use that are summaries, small summaries you can find online. Uh, for, my favorite one is, uh, how do you change a habit if I'm over 25? <laughs> you look up in Google, how do I change my a habit if I am over 25? And it will take you to a place where there is a lot of research being done on the effects of uh, change your brain and you change your life. Like I say in Buddhism, if you change your brain, which is your perspective, how are you looking at things in the world? It will flow out through your brain to your speech, to your actions and change your behavior patterns. So when he sets this thing up, his school for teaching, 
First of all, what does he decide to teach? We just did the Dhammachaka celebration and he taught the first time to the five ascetics. What did he decide to teach them? He taught them how to repeat his investigation and to see if they could wake up and see things as they actually are in uh, and what he's called, and he points to it, he doesn't say it, but there's an ultimate reality is the reality of, of studying and learning how to activate working from an ultimate perspective, an ultimate reality of um, the ultimate reality picture, and then you live your life. This would be practicing when you get angry, seeing the anger and identifying it, even if it happens really fast, letting it go and immediately replacing thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty with loving kindness and compassion in your mind and then taking action. So he's talking about uh, behavioral modification. And he was, he was teaching them, he went to them and he presented the Four Noble Truths and started to present the support system of the Eightfold Path. And in that path is the precious thing that we call TWIM, which we'll get to after a little while here. So the first thing that happens to you is the precepts, the precepts come up. And I'll tell you a funny story, not a long one, but I went to do a study on the precepts I got so frustrated, I had to leave my cootie and go to Bunty's cootie and pound on the door because I looked up um, behavior and I looked up, there's of course it's not under commandments, and I looked up precepts. Precepts was very logical to me. And precepts were not in the index in Bhikkhu Bodhi's Majima Nikai. And I'm thinking like, what's wrong? Why can't I find precepts when I'm going into the index? <laughs> and I finally realized uh, that they were in love with a very old word. And the information for the precepts in the Majima Nikaya is listed under a V word, <laughs> virtue, virtue. But virtue today is not, you know, I don't sort of say, uh, you know, hi, Ardika, I just met you. I don't know if I want to go on a date with you. Are you virtuous? Do I say to you, are you virtuous? I never heard anybody check out somebody for virtue, but you watch a person's behavior. So it wasn't under behavior, rules of behavior or precepts. It's listed in the book under virtue, under V. So just so you know that, and um, yeah, it's there, right. And there's quite a number of them that are, are in the book that way. So what he gives you first is he gives you precepts and the precepts are guidelines for life. Now, these guidelines, um, right up front, nobody's going to strike you dead with lightning if you don't keep your precepts. It doesn't work like that and you don't have to be scared or go to a heavy duty confession about it if you break a precept. But what you do have to do is test the precepts for yourself to understand. Why did he give you these precepts? These precepts are pretty simple, aren't they? I mean, you don't kill or harm human be uh, any beings on purpose, living beings on purpose. You don't steal because you don't want anybody to steal from you. You don't have wrong sexual activity because of the damage it would do, the mental pain it would cause, not physical pain to the other person if it's not consensual. But think about the physical pain if you weren't supposed to be with that other person according to your parents and then the grandparents and then the extended family and then the neighbor, it goes on and on. So if you're not careful with you or your sexual conduct, ramifications are not good at all. And then after the sexual, uh, sexual conduct, you have one about do not lie, but do not lie is not the whole precept. You do not tell lies, you do not gossip, and you do not commit slander. 
So what are these things? These three are related together. So we put these three together, lying, gossiping, and slander, these three, okay? And they're all related to lying. And slander is, gossip is repeating something that you heard, you don't know if it's a lie or not, that's bad. <laughs> and then the slandering is serious business because if you're saying something for the purpose of dividing a group of people, and you're, you, you're trying to get a higher position and get somebody pushed out. This is very bad and it comes back on you and the whole company it makes everything very messy in personnel, in families, everywhere, just everywhere. So slander is a really bad deal. And then the other piece of that one that we need to pay attention to is don't drink, take drugs or alcohol. And it's interesting because the history behind this, if you go back and research it, was there were four precepts. And then this was added later when it became obvious that if we take any alcohol or drugs into the body, we risk breaking these four. We risk breaking the other four. So if we're breaking the other four, we're just making, life is getting, life is really getting miserable. That's what's happening. So when it gets miserable, that's where the hindrances come in. Now the hindrances are the nuarana. And when you're talking, the precepts are the sila and the hindrances are the nuarana. The nuarana are interesting because the nuarana, what makes them come up is if you break a precept. So this is like a, a tit for tat system. If you break this precept, not just one is gonna come up to get you, but two, maybe three of these hindrances are going to come and they're gonna bother your life. So he's, he's giving you this whole thing as a set of wise advice. And he tested it for many, many years, many ways before he decides to give you this as a guideline. So the precepts are really important. And if you break the precept, the hindrance will come up. So what are the hindrances? Well, you have lust and greed and attachment, the first one. You have hatred and aversion for hatred, ill will and aversion for the second one. For the third one, you have sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor is a slow, sleepy, dull mind. So if you're at work and you know, you start having a sleepy, dull mind, the reason that's happening is you broke a precept in this life, or it could be that it was a broken precept before this lifetime. But a lot of times you can see where you broke something from the time you were born until now. And there's one thing about uh, meditation you have to understand when you start to meditate and you're learning to move over into the wholesome way of life and feed that and grow that okay when you do that your mind and your heart are opening up to the world as it opens up then things pop out of your head you've been keeping in the back of your head right back here may have caused you headaches and all kinds of chronic disorders too. And if you allow them, they will fall out. They will come out and finally come out of your system. So it's a cleansing that is taking place just by meditating. It's a cleansing to sit down, be calm, be still, don't move and just breathe. Even that is a cleansing and a calming and tranquilizing action you take after being in the big city and engulfed in the hospital work or the corporate work and you're just overwhelmed. Just being able to sit still, be quiet and just be calm in a quiet place or with earplugs. I've done it in, uh, you know, worked in some really loud places with big equipment and stuff and, uh, just was my nerves were just getting to me and then putting ear you know headphone uh, earplugs and then sitting for even 10 minutes by yourself in the utility closet in the hospital on some wing nobody knows where it is 
and you're sitting quiet for 10 minutes, nobody can get to you. And you're just breathing and just letting it out. And you're forgiving everything that's gone on and using loving kindness. Just there, 10 minutes. It's like a power sit to your body. It is just like plugging your phone into a battery. It's like you are plugging your phone into the earth by being still and stopping and just doing that for a little while. That's what you're doing, okay? Okay, so the, the precepts, uh, we talked about the uh, restlessness, guilt, and remorse. And, and then the last one is, uh, the last one is doubt. Now, what does doubt mean? People come ask me what doubt means. You're stopping your meditation because you're doubting whether you did it this way or did I do it that way or did I do it right or should I change it here or should I change it there? And this is what stops your progress stops your progress and what you want to do is you want to um, just stay in the flow and when you feel the tension coming up of this doubt or the tension coming up of the restlessness or anything you let it go relax your head smile and come back to what you're doing and this is your whole practice this is the whole practice we'll get the whole practice actually in another, uh, another one of the installments. But the first time we ever went and sat down with Bhante, when I was at Washington Buddhist Vihara in 2000, I sat down and the first thing he did was give us the instructions, get comfortable and sit on the floor, give us the instructions, and we sat for 30 minutes. And this quiet, to me, it was deafening because all the noise in the city stopped and it wasn't gone it just stopped and i was there and i was just in this bubble working just in this bubble so immediately you've lifted a huge weight off yourself just very very big weight and then you learn slowly there's more to how to lift the weight off and let it go and let it go and sit just in that place okay so these hindrances, when they come up, the primary thing, I'll, I'm not going to go into them a whole lot right now with this, with this installment, but the hindrances are, have a food and that's how they operate. The secret to the hindrance when you are trying to desperately figure out how can I manage my hindrances, how can I make them stop, is to not try to make them stop and they will go away. <laughs> It's a tricky thing. Why does that work? Well, because if you have a little baby, a little child, and they love some kind of food, and you've got it there, as long as you feed them some more and run away. Again. Ardhika, camera automatically comes to you when she goes off. Yes, because one of us needs to unmute ourselves. Yeah. Sister, can you unmute yourself? I got right. it. You did it. Okay. So that's the hindrance. Now, why? The next question is. The, the whole uh, structure, you know, of summary of Buddhism. When somebody says, "What was it?" Uh, the pop answer, the pop question is what is Buddhism? And the pop answer just comes right out of your mouth is four noble truths. That's what you say. Well, first of all, I want all of you to get the four noble truths right and not say the new version that's floating around because the new version that's floating around will prevent you from making any progress or change in your life but the old standard version that was the traditional one for probably, I don't know, at least 24, 
2,450 years. I think this one has floated in with the last 20 years. It happened. It wasn't there when I first started 20 years ago, and now it is coming out in books and everything. So I'll show you what it is. The original noble truth, very simple. Number one, there is suffering. <laughs> Number two, there is a cause of suffering. Number three, there is a cessation of suffering. And number four, there is a path or a way to reach the cessation of suffering. That's what the whole practice is about. That's the standard one. And now you'll notice something about these. These statements are what we call open-ended statements. That means that if Siddhartha was thinking about searching for something and he said, you know, there is suffering. I am going to go on a search to find it, see? And he, what this there is suffering means there is suffering in life. That's what it means, okay? But that's all it means. And he went to find out what it was and he kept his energy up and he searched for it until he could tell you very specifically paragraph by paragraph what sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair were and he put it into a sutta and described it. We'll probably talk about that later. The second one is there is a cause. Once open and no, so you that makes you curious. And of joy, moments of happiness, all of you have. You cannot tell me you went through your life absolutely sad the whole entire time. It's a lie. So you had moments. Of course, they arose. They were there. They passed away because of Anicca. But the point is, you were not in suffering all the time in your life. That's the point here. There was such a thing as a cessation, and you could feel it. When you smile, if you smile right now, your mind gets lighter and your body starts to clear and cleanse immediately. This is real and it's documented. The last part was the path and that's sort of self-explanatory, but let's see, how did they change it? They changed it in a way that I guarantee you will scare people and keep them away from becoming a Buddhist or inventing or, or investigating it any further and it should stop because it's wrong. And I don't know, as an English teacher, I don't know what happened. Sister, the connection is really bad. Huh? that to him if that's what he was thinking do you think that he would leave his home his wife his baby his father his kingdom everything do you think for one minute that he would have left on a search if that is what someone had said to him or he had thought in his mind no that's a closed statement all of life is suffering it is a fact and there's nothing you can do about it that's a lie and it's not true. And he proved it. The second one, the cause of suffering is desire. Now, this one's tricky because although this is true, it's not correct. Okay, so what do I mean? There is wholesome desire in your life that fulfills the Eightfold Path. Do you want to succeed as a teacher? Do you want to be a good piano teacher? Do you want to be a good doctor? Do you want your children to succeed, have a good marriage, become wealthy? Do you want to? You can succeed at that. 
Well, there's nothing wrong with that desire. But the unwholesome desire is what was so dangerous. Now, the suffering that happens from the wholesome desire is once you're finished and you've gotten to your goal and it goes away, that's suffering. That's true. Okay? So that's what I mean by this one's true, but it's not correct. All desire is not a bad thing, especially for the lay community. Sometimes we get very confused with reading about Buddhism when we pick up the suttas and try to read them. We forget that many of the suttas are addressed specifically to the monks and monastics and pertain to them. But other suttas pertain to us very well to the degree that we can follow what they're saying in our lay life. You see? So we have to be careful and, and be uh, discre discrepancy there. I mean, let's examine it. Be careful about it, right? Okay, the next one was there is a cessation of suffering. This one is especially dear to my heart. I was in North Carolina and a friend had her 13 year old daughter come with her for the first time to a Thai temple in High Point, North Carolina. Sitting on the floor, she was listening to the monk give a talk on the Four Noble Truths. Oh boy, he was giving these that I'm talking to you about. And she was hanging her head down saying, whoa, I don't want to come here again. <laughs> I don't want to come here ever again with my mom. I gave up shopping for shoes at the mall to come with my mom this Saturday to the Buddhist temple. And this man is telling me, this monk is telling her to have the cessation of suffering. You must desire absolutely nothing well, what happened to wholesome desire? <laughs> what happened to wholesome desire? You cannot set up cessation of suffering. The answer being that you wish to have absolutely nothing. There is nothing wrong with a rich man, a middle level man, a, low, a poor person, nothing wrong with any of that. There's nothing wrong with making money. It's what you do with your money or what your money does to you that is the issue with money. Always remember that. You know, I don't have any money anymore. <laughs> Just like Bhante. It took five years for me to understand that if I had extra money, I'd give it to you if you don't have anything to eat or give extra food to somebody who doesn't have anything to eat. Or if there's anything somebody gives me that I can't use, I give it to somebody else. Because why? Because when you give it to me, it's mine. And then I get to give it to somebody else because I, it's mine briefly. And in 24 hours, I give it to someone else if I can't use it. And what can I use? I don't shop. I have one pair of shoes. I have three pairs of clothes. That's it. And what do I shop for anymore? You see? It's crazy. Okay. Anyway. So, well, using the noble truths, the last one is the path, and they left the path there, but when they teach the path, as they started teaching the path, this 13-year-old leaned over to her mom and said very quietly in her ear, Mom, I came here because I really love you, and I wanted to come with you to the temple, but Mom... She got cooked at the door. She got stopped at the door because somebody changed the Four Noble Truths. One set is an invitation. The other set is a statement that basically I would not have gone near Buddhism if I had heard that. But I heard them the right way. So practicing the Noble Truths, what do I mean? If you practice the Noble Truths, they, what does that mean? There's a statement about Buddhism. The noble truths turn out to be a map. They are a map for your successful practice in meditation, okay? And the way the Buddha was practicing, he was first asking 
if you look in the suttas, they're all, that's the third, the, set, the next part is he taught every lesson he taught. This was his method for teaching. First, I will present to you the problem, the suffering. Second, I will show you the cause of that suffering. Third, I will show you what the cessation of that suffering looks like. And fourth, I will show you the path, the supporting path that will support you so that you can get to the cessation of suffering. It was a masterpiece. He was a genius. It was, turns out, we turned it into a summary of Buddhism in modern times. But back then, in, in the suttas, it's his path of investigation. If I look up the investigation in the Samyutta Nikaya, it's described according to the proper investigation, according to Four Noble Truths. If I go into the Majima Nikaya, there's probably about six or seven that I know about suttas that are using it that way and talking step by step. And then I took the Majima Nikaya 152 suttas and wanted to see how far this goes. And when I did, I could find three or four noble truths in almost all 152 suttas in the book. So it was a teaching method, very, very organized. You can take it, and this is the next part. You can take it and use it in your office to give speeches. What is the challenge I'm going to speak to you about? What do you think the cause of this is in this company, and why are we not making enough money? What's the block, the blockage? What's the barrier, the cause of it? What do you think the cessation of the problem is, or the cessation of this challenge? What do you, and the last part is, what do you suggest as a solution? And then we take and say, as Buddhists, we would take and say, can we accomplish this man's solution for his company to solve his problem and do it? personally and not fight with each other and have a wholesome view of things, the way we look at things? Can we keep images in our mind that are healthy and wholesome and kind? Can we do that? Can we have good communication between each other? Can we have wholesome kind of work that we're doing and living situations so we have some place in our house Okay, so the Four Noble Truths, very, very useful thing, very useful thing. Um, the next one is you look at, um, I'm not going to go into dependent origination because there's an independent installment on that lesson about dependent origination, but right up front, we use dependent origination to show you um, exactly how suffering happens when we talk about the contact, when you see, hear, smell, taste, or touch something, the contact, the feeling, how the craving happens, how the clinging happens, how you react. There are two little, two little links that have to do with that. That we're going to learn in this course is that when we talk about dependent origination and we spend our time learning about how does phenomena arise in the mind and then it's there and then it always goes away. So when you're learning to watch dependent origination, you're also
goes away. So you're witnessing a nature. When something arises that's a hindrance, when it's not there and it arises when it is there, if it starts to give you a problem, it's giving a problem because you're feeding it. That's why it's giving you the problem. And then it passes away. And that's the dukkha. When you're feeding it and you're starting to get tight and your mind is tight and you want to go off your object of meditation, that is the point where you are seeing the dukkha, how it affects you. And then when you let it go and you're practicing twim, you are practicing letting it go. You, rec you, see, you recognize it's there. You recognize it's tight. You let go of it. You relax the head. You smile and you come back with a smile. When you're doing that, what's happening? You are practicing an impersonal concern about the hindrance. Impersonal nature is anatta. The anatta is looking at everything impersonally. Don't take it personally. There's no reason to take anything personally. We talked about this last week when we talked about what's going on with people inside lockdown, inside the lockdown, we talked about what was happening for them. And we said, if it is happening, just listen to just a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta, okay? Whatever's happening in the present time, meaning in the next five minutes, okay? When it happens, it's gonna be over, isn't it? Do you know of anything that happened and it didn't get over? I don't know anything, you know? One time, I was very stubborn about this when I was learning it with Bhante. I had to drive a truck from all the way up in Massachusetts, northern Massachusetts, all the way to Florida by myself. It would take me three days if I did it the proper way, the proper, you know, speed and everything. And I told him on the phone, I don't believe that everything is impermanent. I told him that. And he said, okay, you've got three days while you're driving, before you sleep, when you get up, I want you to constantly run it through your mind and tell me when you get here, you tell me if you found anything, I mean anything that was permanent. I said, okay, I will. <laughs> I got in the truck. I drove 1300 miles <laughs> in three days. I did what he said and have anything else to do. And when I got to the other end, I went there and I knocked on the, on, I knocked on the, knocked on the door of his cootie where he was. He, goes, he said, how's it going? <laughs> and he says, how's it going? I said, I found it. And he said, found what? <laughs> I found something that is permanent. What did he say? He said, what? Impermanence. And I walked away. <laughs> the impermanent. Everything in the universe is impermanent. Nothing is sitting still. Everything is moving. You can't even sit on the ground, on the grass, or at the beach and relax and say that you are sitting still. Why? Well, the earth is turning. <laughs> so the, you're moving even if you don't think you're moving, you're moving, you're moving. You can't get away from it. Everything in it's a state of flux. Look in the Hubble scope and the somebody scope and the next scope. And there's billions of stars and they're all moving. Everything's moving, including you. You're not the same person you were yesterday. And every eight years, you have almost a completely new body. If you keep taking care of it the proper way, you're going to be just fine. You look like me when you're 72. <laughs> You'll be fine, okay? You just, just keep, take care of yourself. Okay, the next piece. When you start your practice, I... I wasn't sure I believed what Bhante was saying, but I know he never lies to me, ever. Has never, never, never lied to me. And he taught us that the beginning of our training was Dana Sila Bhavana and then Sila Samadhi Panya. 
I once had a guy call me in the United States from Canada. He called me. He said, what are you doing? Online, you are talking about Donna C. Lubavina. Nobody's talking about Donna C. Lubavina. Everybody's talking about Sila Samadhi Banyu. What's wrong with you? And I said, well, uh, I went away and thought about it for 24 hours how to answer this. And then I, I called him back and I said, I didn't quite know how to say this short for you, but Donna Sila Bhavana sets you up for a successful Sila Samadhi Panya. That's the answer, you see? So we have to look at what these are and it's very important, very important. When I was in Sri Lanka, I had an opportunity to sit down with a teacher who taught for over 60 years as a monk in the forest, in the deep forest, he was a meditation teacher and he really taught away from people, you know, you had to go up in there to where he was, ask to be a student, stay there. And um, I was just visiting him and I, I, I thought I'd ask him about this. When people come to you, what is the first thing you do to them, with them? What do you ask them to do when they first come? First of all, they have to, if they're going to stay there in the camp and they brought their sleeping bag or their mat to sleep on, whatever. They have to make a commitment to him. They will practice dana all the time. So what is dana? Dana is generosity. They have to accept the precepts, the basic precepts, and they're just five, the five precepts when you first come. And they have to practice dana all the time, which is, uh, is the um, generosity of what? Generosity of thoughts, generosity of speech, generosity of action with the body. In that camp, living with those other people who you do not know, and there's almost no equipment, the way I was living in the forest in Missouri when we were building it, there was just nothing, you know, no equipment. You know, big barrels of water, and that's a bath. <laughs> and um, sleeping in tents and, and uh, on platforms and wherever we could in the beginning, you see? and. So he said, you have to practice Donna because you have to be able to learn to live with people. And no matter what they do, you cannot get angry. You have to practice forgiveness and it's part of the Donna. It's part of the generosity is forgiveness. And we do have the forgiveness practice that we use for cleansing the person. And we teach them how to cleanse the mind if you have a blockage and you cannot practice Meta. And why would you have a blockage? Because you do not like yourself. And if you do not like yourself, how can you send loving kindness to someone else if you do not love yourself? And when you start practicing loving kindness, we watch out of 35 people, there are usually five or six that run into a wall. The first day, the second day, Metta comes up and they, they're happy and they can give, they might even feel joy. Then it disappears on them and they can't do anything. What happened? They're holding something inside their head that they did that they have not let go of and they need to forgive themselves and It'll float up when you practice the way we teach you and then you forgive yourself and forgive the other person and keep going with that until the other person forgives you and you feel, whoo, everything, relief, a huge weight coming off and falling off of you. When Bhante examined this and decided how to teach this, he had done it for two years. When he taught it to me, I was in bad shape in the beginning. I did it for six months. Then I stopped as a main practice, but I still have the tool. That's it. I still have this tool of, of this tool, say, in my toolbox, life's little toolbox. It's in my toolbox, and I can pull it out and park and do forgiveness if I run into trouble and put it back in the box. Do you understand? So it's a tool for cleansing if you get stuck so that you can continue to pursue the path and go down easily. So the first, the, what I said, well, there's Donna C. La Bhavana, what's the other one? And the old monk said, Bhavana is the, is the third one. And it, what does it mean? Well, it means development of mind, 
and it means development of behavior. And I said, how to do that? He says, well, did you change your behavior when you started being generous and you were kind and following the precepts? Your behavior starts to shift. And one of the first uh, suttas we teach you is number 19. And if you listen to the very beginning of, of number 19, it is a confession by the Buddha, what he's doing in a nutshell. So listen to how this goes. Um, it's the Dwayda Vitaka Sutta, and it's number 19. And he says, uh, before my enlightenment, while I was still an enlightened bodhisattva, uh, it occurred to me, suppose I divide my thoughts into two classes. Now you watch, he's experimenting before he's a Buddha. And then I said on one side, thoughts of sensual desire and thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side, thoughts of renunciation and non-ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. Non-ill will is what? It is loving kindness. And non-cruelty is what? It is compassion. So then what he does is he abided thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, and thought of sensual desire arose in me. And then he practiced this thought of sensual desire has risen in me. It leads to my affliction. It leads to others' affliction and the affliction of both of us. It obstructs my wisdom, causes difficulties. It leads me away from Nibbana. This sutta to me is very important. It's like a high school kid who takes a science project and he tries to lay out and test good thoughts and bad thoughts. Do I want to live here or do I want to live there? What we don't, don't, not something that isn't even Buddhist is what goes around comes around. What you give out, that's what you get back. So you start hitting somebody, someday somebody's going to turn around and hit you. And it might not be the same person, but by the time you are about 25 or 30 years old, I have not met anybody who has not had something they did wrong when they were young, turn around and bite them from behind, okay, in their life, the same way they treated somebody, they get treated. It's a funny thing. I'm very curious and I ask a lot of questions with people and you know, I have never met anybody who can tell me they had this perfect life where they were just so perfect that they never did anything where it didn't ever come back on them. This is, this is the guy who, you know, uh, pulls the pigtails of the kid that's sitting in front of him and then tells the teacher it's the girl's fault. And later on, something happens in the 20s where they run into each other in the neighborhood. Somehow she does something to him that reminds him what he did to her years and years later. It's strange. It's very strange. This, by the way, is what we say is karma and karma operating on a scale like this, you know, like this. If I do this and it's like here, okay, then pretty soon this is going to come back here because pretty soon something will get me to push me down and I'm going up and down and up and down in life. It's a scale thing. But there's a lot of old wives uh, sayings about this. What goes around comes around. The Christians are do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh-huh. And uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And doing it, uh, the man that is most worthy of the prayer, I used to like this one, is the one who prays in the closet and no one sees him pray. That's the purest prayer. And there you are sitting alone in meditation, not bothering anybody. You see, these things are tied very neatly together. We say that probably we're, we're practicing in uh, loving kindness and compassion the same way that St. Francis of Assisi was practicing when the little animals came around his feet. You ever see a picture of this monk 
Christian monk sitting there with all the animals around him. It was a very favorite one when we were in Sunday school. And I went up the mountain once and I practiced the first time for two hours. And when I came out of the two hours sitting, I was sitting on a big rock facing a big tree. And Bhante had given me a brown robe, a little different color from this. And I was sitting in a brown robe. I was not moving at all. And when I opened my eyes, there was a squirrel in my lap and there were birds around my feet. And everything was right next to me and my energy was changing. They would never come near me walking in the woods, but I was absolutely still. Of course, I sort of sloughed it off at that time. I said, look, I was brown and the tree was brown and they didn't know the difference because the tree didn't move and I didn't move. And that's all there is to this, <laughs> you know? But actually he told me it's a little more than that because your energy started to balance with the energy in the nature in this forest. And then they come around, they come very close. This is how it's work. So Donna Sila Bhavan is the first one. The second one, the second level is Sila Samadhi Panya. Now the Donna, I didn't say the most important part. Why are you practicing generosity? What is the functional reason for you to practice this? Not just for you to feel happy when you're doing it and lighter, but when you do feel lighter, what is happening to you when you smile? What is happening to your lungs and your heart when you smile? Yeah, your heart is feeling softer and it's opening. You're softening and opening your heart. You're saying, I'm ready to look at this and I wanna see how all this works. You're opening yourself to the universal um, energy is what you're doing when you start. So this is your preparatory step. The dana and the sila is protecting you from the hindrances and now you're going to practice this bhavana and the first practice is going to be the sila which has the mm -hmm. includes the dana in it and the samadhi we say samadhi everybody says samadhi most of the time it means uh, deep concentration and we come along and we say, but in Pali, you can divide the word and sama means samata. The root word for samata is sama. You can look at it that way. And the D-H-I is a root word for wisdom. Oh, so now we have a, a serene wisdom or tranquil wisdom. It is the uh, root word for uh, tranquility and tranquility Samatha is serenity. So you can say this is a tranquil wisdom meditation is what this is. Do we have insights? Oh yes, we have all the insights that happen in other insight practices. They all happen, you know, very, very naturally. But we understand not to get excited about them because there's signs on the road and we're driving a long way down this path. So we don't get overly excited about, I've got this one, I've got that one, I got, anyway, you don't have it, because why? Anicca. <laughs> it's there, you have it, you see it, you know it, but it's not going to stay there with you. I once met a woman who said to us, I don't need to talk to you about the fourth jhana, I already had the fourth jhana as if to say she still has it from a retreat she had a year before and it's in her pocket somewhere. <laughs> it's not in your pocket. You don't get to keep these things. These are just states that are, are arising, are there and pass away. Can you learn to use them? Yes. Can you use them in life? A lot of them, yes. Okay, can they help you in life? Oh, yes. But they still are not there, they arise. They are there and they pass away. Where is this training going to lead? Well, you have the ultimate objective in Buddhism, which is to go through the path and four levels of attainments that are happening with fruitions on each one. So that's eight points that you're going through. And actually we're not going up, we're actually going down, deeper, 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 and quieter and quieter. And the one, the one I like the best is, you know, how does the Buddha teach? And uh, he says to him, uh, let's see, where is that? It's 107. You look in 107 in section three, and you're going to find out 
what the Buddha says to this man in the front of his discussion with him. And he says, whoops, wait a minute, 107, I'm sorry, 107. Mogalana, go, go, um, Gopaka Mogalana, right? No, that's eight. Ganaka Mogalana, Ganaka Mogalana, sorry. And he says to him in section two, he says, in the palace of Magara's mother, there can be seen by the monks, the gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. That is down to the last step of the staircase. So we're going down, we're not really going up. We like to show people charts so they think they're going up. <laughs> That's kind of funny, you think you're going up. But you're actually, you're going down deeper and you're getting quieter and more still and more still and more still and sitting longer, longer, longer. So you can see and watch longer and longer the finer movements that occur inside you and see how they work. Do they work the same way? But the ultimate point is Nibbana. And the only thing I'm going to say about Nibbana is I can talk to you about what it isn't, but I can't talk to you about what it is because there are no concepts in Nibbana. Nibbana itself is a concept, but we can't describe this concept because it's a no concept place. It's kind of tricky. So is this a place? No. Is it a city you go to? No. Is it the... Uh, the pure land, no, in pure land or Buddhism, they want to um, work and help people as much as they can. This is not a bad thing. In this life and then get good enough, they can go to the pure land in their next life and then go to Nibbana. That's how that works. That's not bad. That's a, one of the trails that, they, that happens in the, in the Mahayana Buddhism, okay? But you're taught in a gradual way and the Buddha has fun describing to you the gradual way. Um, I'll show you this briefly. Let's see what time it is. I, I want to make sure I can get through this whole. Yeah, we're okay. Um, uh, 65, section 77. I got that right. Okay, 65, 77. Mm -hmm. So this is special because. Um, that can't be right. <laughs> what happened? Um, just one second. 65.33, that makes more sense. Now, Badali. Badali is an important name. Badali was the name of a clever horse trainer who obtains a fine thoroughbred cult. Now, he's going to turn this colt into a, a very good horse for the king. He's going to make, turn it into a king's horse. And this is how he trains it. And when we're describing what Badale does to train the horse, we are, it's a simile to how we are training you as you're going through your training. He first makes the colt get used to wearing a bit in his mouth. The bit goes in the mouth and it pulls on the side of the mouth here. It's sore at first when they're not used to it. And because he is, the colt is asked to do something that he has never done before, this is wonderful and this is you. <laughs> he displays some contortions, writhing and vacillation, but through constant repetition and gradual practice and patience, he becomes peaceful in wearing the bit. When the cult has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him get used to wearing a harness, puts the harness on his back so that he can be used to pull a cart if they want. And when the cult is being made to wear the harness. He's doing something he never did before again. And so he goes through contortions and objections, writhing and vacillation, 
but with constant repetition, you, you should memorize this line, constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in his action. I'm doing this because we're trying to train the brain that whenever anything disturbing comes up in our life, we sense the tension, we recognize it, let it go, relax our head, smile and come back to what we're doing. And this is the contortion part. And the writhing part is us trying to stop the hindrance instead of letting it go and relaxing and smiling and just coming back to what we're doing. And he becomes peaceful in his action. And then he does this again and he makes him act in keeping in step. That's a, a lesson. And then running in a circle and then prancing and then galloping and then charging. In the kingly qualities, in the kingly in the highest speed, galloping with the best fleetness and the highest gentleness and calm. This is how you train a horse. That's what you do. That's how we train you. We don't have to train so much, but be still. Keep your posture straight. Keep your energy up. Keep in balance. Don't let your head fall. Keep your head up. Don't move at all in any way. Stay absolutely still and follow the instructions. So it's just like training a horse is what the other man was saying to the Buddha. Okay, so this is how the training works. And everything that is happening in the training is to alter the mind, speech, and bodily calming and changing and reaching equanimity results in the person pausing and not reacting, but learning to respond to what's happening. So we don't have to get the stick out or anything else. Instead, it's an invitation to actually remember that little thing you heard when you were young. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But then we grow up and somebody yells at you and you yell at them and they pull a punch and you pull a punch. They pull out a knife and you pull out a, a knife or you yell and run away and scream and everything else. When you could have probably taken them to get ice cream <laughs> or had tea or fed them or just kind of, you know, what's really going on here? Let's stop and look at what's really the challenge. And for us in India right now, the challenge, oh my gosh, I stopped counting in my diary. It was 115 days when Bonte left to go back to the United States. Now I'm gonna stay here till September. They told me I stay till September. So there you go. Okay, fine. Yep. Now, Tanha. We get into Tanha in the description in the paper I send you. We don't go a lot into it, but Tanha is the I like the craving. And this is important when you're practicing meditation and your objective is to look at the cause of craving, uh, cause of the suffering. We start by saying the cause is suffering. Yeah, I'm sorry, the cause of the suffering is craving. We start there. If I say that to you, what does it mean? How do you see craving? You have to know what this craving is and how it manifests or else how can you let it go? It's like me saying to you, you need to um, drop the ball. Well, where's the ball? And then, or something, I need you to let go of something. I tell you, recognize this and then release it relax your head and smile and come back. You see, let go of what? Where is the craving? What is it? Okay, here's how it works. When you hear somebody say something to you, you hear a sound with the ear and ear consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is ear contact with contact as condition. Feeling arises. The feeling is unpleasant. And when the feeling arises, craving occurs. And what is the craving? It's the I don't like it mind. Craving always comes up 
as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. The, this, head, this head, by the way, is, is in, sort of like an epiphany. It's like news. <laughs> the head is part of the body. <laughs> and it sounds funny, I'm saying this to you, but you don't realize how much of the world believes that the body goes from here down. And nobody wants to talk about the head. Did you know that? See, you can have a broken leg or you can have cancer, you can have a heart condition, you can be sick at your stomach, and you'll tell people about it, right? But if you have something wrong or a disorder in your head, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want anybody to know your sister has a depression in their head. If the head is ill for some reason, we don't want to talk about it. We have not broken that taboo. We still are stuck with this head. I understand it's one of the heaviest parts of the body too, but, <laughs> but the point is, it is part of your body. And the interesting part about the head is the mind is somewhere here. And when we change our mind and relax our mind, the whole body starts to relax down through. The mind-body connection is Nama Rupa. The Buddha figured this out. The doctors today confirm it's real. So if you calm your mind, you can slow your heartbeat. If you calm your mind, you can lower your blood pressure. I've done it with the doctor. <laughs> we played a game, he didn't believe me. And he took my blood pressure. I was on a, a wrong medication one time when I had a car accident. And he, he told me it was that high. And I said, no, it's not, I took it this morning. He said, yeah, well, it's that high. And I said, okay, give me five, a couple minutes. He went outside, he came back in, he took it again, and it was about 20 points lower. Only because I calmed down completely inside, and then it drops, you see. So you, you can learn to control this, along with your controlling your, uh, the flow of your circulation and things like this. You can really learn to help your body. It's really interesting what can happen. So Tanha, it uh, always comes up the same way with tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. It is the I don't like it or the I like it mind. If it's I like it, you go to I want it and then you get attached and you can't stop thinking about that pair of shoes that were matching your outfit and you want to go back and get them <laughs> at the store, right? Or if you, you see something bad and, and you don't like it, and you don't want it, you have an aversion to it, then you get attached to trying to make it stop. But aversion is a pushing and attachment is a pulling and the tension in the body is the same. Keshi Damananda said some wonderful things that I think I left most of them, I think I left in the document uh, that I gave you. Um, he talks about the real gift that um, uh, the Buddha gave us. I pulled a couple things, just a couple short things here out. Um, how I was interested when I started practicing and started studying, I was really interested to know. Uh, one time a guy in New York, he called and he said, you know, it's a real shame. I have to tell you, it's a real shame that the Buddha, he taught for 45 years and he only gave us one set of instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta. Of course, I knew that wasn't true, but this was a man who had been meditating for 25 years on the East Coast. And in all that time, every place he'd ever gone, any temple, anybody, listened to anybody, he had never heard any instructions or advice the Buddha left for his monks about their meditation and development, except those instructions there. So just to give you an idea, there's a short one here, this seven points. And um, how does uh, a noble disciple, that's a good meditator who's practicing, possess seven good qualities? Um, how here a noble disciple starts with faith. And what is faith? He places his faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment, thus. He looks at the Tathagata, is another name for the Buddha. The blessed one is accomplished, he is fully enlightened, he is perfect in true knowledge. 
in his conduct. He is perfect. He is sublime, a knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. A teacher of gods and humans, he is enlightened and he is blessed. So he puts his faith in what he's seen, meaning the Buddha, he puts his faith there. Next one is he has shame. The student has shame. He is ashamed of misconduct in body, speech, and mind. He is ashamed of engaging in evil, unwholesome deeds. This is a thing called hiri and otapa. Hiri and otapa. The hiri, I think, is the shame, and the otapa is the guilty feeling. So you ask, you, you can ask yourself for forgiveness or say, I broke this precept. I'm not going to break it again. Take your precepts yourself. You don't need a priest or a monk or a nun or anyone to give you precepts. We don't give them to you. You say them with us. We don't give them to you, you see? And when we teach you the precepts, it's nice to do it at the temple, true. But you should be saying them every morning or every night to remind yourself to continue good behavior. He has a fear of wrongdoing. This is the, okay, so here is the shame, and Otapa is the wrongdoing, I think. He is afraid of misconduct in body, speech, and mind, and, and engaging in evil, unwholesome deeds. He has learned much. This is, this is what you're learning now. You are learning much. Remember what you are learning. Consolidate what you have learned. Such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing and affirm a good holy life or practice that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these, he has learned much. This is what you have done when you're, when you're studying the right way. You have learned much, remembered it, recited it verbally, investigated it with your mind and penetrated it by well, well by view meaning seen it impersonally, seen it impersonally, penetrated it by your view, not observation. Then he is energetic, energetic in abandoning unwholesome states and undertaking wholesome states. He is steadfast, firm in his striving, not remiss in developing wholesome states. So this is right effort. This is twin. He recognizes the... Uh, unwholesome mind state, he lets it go, he abandons it. And in, under, in undertaking it, then he is steadfast, firm in striving and not remiss. In other words, when he's steadfast, firm in striving, he smiled and came back and kept going. And then he's developing wholesome state, he's not remiss. He keeps developing more wholesome states like the smile. The smile is a wonderful thing, why? Well. I don't have any money and it's cheap and I can make everybody in this building smile. <laughs> I can. If you give me cookies right now, I'm not eating cookies and I'll give them to everybody in the building. <laughs> you know, and so I can make them smile without just smiling at them. They want to smile. It's fun. You turn on your smile, you can lift a person up. You don't have to touch them, go near them or anything but you can smile at them. Little kid falls down, you, you don't have to pick him up, but if you smile, it's, oh, it's gonna be okay. Get up and do it again. There you go. You see, you can do it, and guess what? It doesn't cost you anything. And he is mindful, and he possesses the highest mindfulness skill. He recalls and he recollects what has been done in the past and remembers it's from the past and spoken of long ago, these lessons he practices. You see, he, it means he reviews the text is what that phrase actually is talking about. And then he is wise. Listen to this one, Ardika. He possesses wisdom regarding the rise and disappearance that is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of craving. It's talking about the arising existence and disappearance of phenomena in your mind. How does something arise? How is it there? How does it pass away? And what's the effect on you? How does it, how, what can you do with the suffering? And you take the Four Noble Truths 
and there was no suffering and it arose and if you bite on it hold on to it and give it a big hug it's going to cause suffering it's like hugging a hot coal but it'll just pass away if you let it go by that is how a noble student or disciple possesses seven good qualities so i really like that one that was a good one to find and the other one i found for you um i don't want to do that one I'm, i'll leave that one until next time okay so the last thing I'm going to do for you is, uh, and I want to take some questions. I hope we have, we'll have some time because I'm just going to read very quickly. I'm going to read to you the simile that I put down in the paper. I put the simile in the paper for you. And so I want to, I want to minimize this and go back to there for a minute while I can read it to you. Oh no, I can, I can leave this up. Okay, stay up. Oh, I have to do that in order to get to the... I'm sorry. And I go, oops. Yeah, at the very bottom of this, I know you can hear me. I, I really got interested in the Buddha and his similes. And I thought he, he must have, in order for the monks to be supported, I was fascinated because Bhante was taking me to many temples to see all the way the monks are supported. and. I met monks that were 45 monks, 45 years and 65 years monks and how they had been supported all their life. And I started wondering what it was that the common person must have done with this in the time of the Buddha. Did he give the common person something, you know, that would really be good for them to practice in their life? And what we talked about right now is something they could work with. Now, here's a simile for you. The Buddha Dhamma reminds me, it reminded me when I was starting of a new garden plot. The new garden locations, when we set them up, the first thing is we need the soil preparation before planting. Number two, you till the ground to loosen up the soil. Number three, you rest the ground briefly. Then, you fertilize, the fourth one is you fertilize the soil. And then number five, you're planting and you don't crowd your plants when you plant them. in the garden book and number 10 you preserve the seeds for the next harvest after you reap your uh your harvest now let's compare this with you and your training the first thing we do the soil preparation is where we cleanse the mind before meditation and we cleanse your heart too with donna number two we loosen up the soil. Okay, we soften and open your heart. There you go. Number three, we rest the ground briefly. Okay, we take care of you. We take care that you have enough energy for your practice. Number four, fertilize the soil is giving ear to the Dhamma and learning the instructions. Stay Uh oh, what happened? Wait. <laughs> did you lose it? Did you lose it or did you hear it? We, no. I, I muted him. No problem. You did hear it? Okay. Just let me do the last part of it for just a second. I didn't quite finish. I didn't know what happened. Somebody made a lot of noise. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, number five is you don't crowd your plants. You don't mix your practice with other practices. Number six, you water and nurture the young plants. You keep your practice going. We nurture the plants so they'll keep growing. You keep your practice going so it doesn't fall away. Number seven, pluck out the weeds. You abandon your hindrances. Number eight, 
hoeing to hold in the moisture. You build interest, patience, persistence, and perseverance with your practice. Number nine, follow the advice in the garden book. Well, that's easy. We follow the advice in the suttas and listen to your guide. Number 10, preserve the seeds for next harvest. And what we do is we preserve our progress for, by continuing our meditation at home and using it in life. And that's basically um, what is coming to you in the page for this week. And I need you to look at the page and then question. And it, if you think there's something should really be in this first page that isn't there, tell me. This original prog uh, project was unique because I was training and it was wonderful for me to have to dig all this out and figure out everything. But when I did it originally, we had a huge population on our support group online. And we told them we, I want, he wanted me to do this. And I started building this, but we asked everybody to contribute to it. So lots of people sent in, this should be here. This is, you're not saying this part clear enough. Please uh, remember to say this along with that things like that. And we read everything. I read everything. And then we tried to finalize it and put it up as far as it went. And all of a sudden we started traveling around the world and it, we didn't quite get finished the whole project. That's what happened. So now the floor is open for questions. Um, 